and welcome to Cross Point Church. And let me say, Happy New Year! For all of you that stayed up late last night, I'm proud of you for being here. For those of you that were normal like me and just went on to bed because it wasn't going to make no difference anyway. Man, I, I'm just so glad that we are alive, that God has blessed us with a brand new year to start and just to uh, the opportunity to worship him today and be grateful for that. So let's all stand together. We're going to pray and we're going to get started. We're going to sing some worship. We're going to have a word and we're just going to spend some time with the Lord today. Heavenly Father, we praise your name and we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, and for your grace. And God, I just ask that you would move in this place today in a real way, that God, you and you alone would take control of this service, that your name would be praised, your name would be lifted up as we sing these worship songs, as we lift up your word, that God, your name would be glorified. We just want to praise you and thank you for your mercy, grace, and love on us. Amen. Amen. Darkness tries to roll over my bones 
When sorrow comes to steal the joy out When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken And my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love And my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love And my fear doesn't stand a chance today, Father God. As we start a new year, help us to keep you in the forefront of our mind, Father God, and just know that you have a purpose and a plan for us. May we be open to that today, Father God. May we be open to your word. May all of this word fall on fertile soil. We love you, Father God, and we praise you. You guys can be seated. So last year didn't turn out as you hoped. Things took a turn, a bump, a darkened sky. And at times it may have seemed there was no hope. But here's the good news. Our God 
is the God of fresh starts. Our God is the God of new beginnings. Our God brings new mercies, new compassions, not just once a year, not just when things are bad, but every single morning. This year has been tough. And for many of us, things will never be the same. But we are here, breathing, maybe smiling, or crying, or shouting, or laughing. But we are here, feeling, maybe fighting, or cheering, or seeking, or grieving, but we are here living, and we are not alone, our God is here, our God is with us, and our God is the God of new creations. There we go. These things work better when they're on. And I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, my name is Jeff Pope. If you do not know me, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and so I'm grateful that you're here, grateful that you joined us, and grateful that you've come to be a part of what God's going to do today, today in your life. Today is a brand new day. It is. Most of you I've not seen since last year. I just want you to know, but it's good to see you today. And today is the beginning of 2023, and so it's a brand new day. You know, for many of us, we've started out, maybe you've made some New Year's resolutions. I got some things I want to do. I want to eat a little less. I want to lose a little weight. I want to take better care of myself. Maybe you bought a treadmill for Christmas, and you can hang the clothes on it in about a month or so. Maybe you bought you a new gym membership, and you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm in on this. I am in on this. And about a month later, you're going to try to figure out how you can get that money back because that didn't work out good. And some of you will be committed. Some of you will be full on into that. But what I want you to be committed to within this new year is Jesus Christ. What I want is to see your life changed and new and fresh and exciting. Because what's happened up to this moment is your story. You see, my story is different from your story, and your story is different from my story. We all have a story. We all have places we've been in our lives. We've all had tragedy and hardship and struggle. We've had joys. We've had fun. For some of you, you had a wonderful week of Christmas. For some of you, it was the one time that you had to see the people you don't like very much, which could be your very family. But the thing is, is that your story has brought you to this moment right here, right now. And so what I want you to know is that you are here because Jesus wanted you to be here today. God wanted you here to hear something that can change your life forever. So all of us have a story. Now, our stories can be interconnected our lives together because we come to this church together and we share things together and we share opportunities together and we share ministry together. Our lives are interconnected. Perhaps you and I are both facing different challenges, but maybe the challenge you're going through is something I've been through or maybe the challenge that you're going through is something that you can share with me at a later date or something, something that has changed your life that draws you closer to God. Maybe it's the people around you the people you work with, that they'll finally get to see something really real within your life. Because a lot of times what happens is we become Christians, we get saved, and then a lot of times we kind of we become introverts. We don't necessarily want to share our faith because we're worried about what that means. We're worried about what it means to be an example to other people. Some of us are scared because we know who we are. I know who I am for the last 54 years. The first five or six are probably a little lost because I don't remember those at all. But, but for the last 54 years, I know who I am. 
I know the faults that I have. I know the struggles that I have. I know who I am. And there are times that I don't like me very much. There's probably times that other people don't like me very much. My life has brought to this moment right here, right now, and I know who I am. I know where I came from. I know the struggles I have had, just like you know. But our lives can be different, but we are, we are God's people. We are God's church, and being that, we should carry one another. We should lift each other up. We should pray for one another. If we spent as much time praying for each other as we did gossiping about what was going on, lives would be changed and radically different. But what happens is we all want the juice. We all want to know what's going on. Praise God for Facebook. I, I saw a little meme that said, uh, if you live in a small town and you don't know what's going on in your life, don't worry, somebody else does. That's just something to think about. But Paul wrote in Galatians 6, 2 and 3, he said this. He said, share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. This is so awesome. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself, you're not that important. The moment that we allow pride into our lives, when we think our lives are so much more important, that God needs me, God needs me to be out serving him. God needs me to help pastor in this church. God allows me these opportunities, just like God allows you those opportunities. You see, God can do anything without us, but he loves us enough to let us be involved. How cool is that? I had a pastor made an analogy one time that said, you know, if I work construction and I could go to the construction site, and maybe my child is maybe 10 years old, and I'm going to say, hey, I want you to go. I want you to come and help me today. I want you to put on your little hard hat, bring your tools, and help me today. It wasn't because the child could do anything. It wasn't because he was even needed, but because the father wanted him to be a part of what was going on. God wants you to be a part of what's going on. And Paul said, look, we're not that important. We should carry each other's burdens. So let's think for a moment about people throughout the Bible who sought after Jesus. Those who were looking for God. Those who were, who were looking for hope. I think our world could use some hope right now. I think there's a lot of things going on that we need some hope. And the tough thing is is that we serve the risen Savior. We should be the ones who are filled with hope. And yet, how many of you struggled with depression this last year? I say that because I did too. How many of you battled things in your life that you did not know how you could break free from? We don't hold the hope that God has given us. Part of our problem is that we assume that once we become Christians, life will get easy. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. There are battles ahead. You can read throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament of those who chose to follow Jesus died, were crucified, were killed, were stoned. Now, I'm not giving you a great resume here. You're like, woohoo! But I want you to understand that your life, when we give our lives to God, when we make that sacrifice, Jesus has already paid our price. Our lives are not just what happens for however many years you have on this earth. We have an eternity, and our reward is not based here. Will God give you some things in your life? Absolutely. Will some of you be wealthy? Absolutely. Will some of us be poor? Absolutely. But God will bless you. But it's not about who you are. It is that everything that you do and everything that you have that you can use to lift up the name of Jesus and share God's love with others. Jesus said this. 
John 8, 36, he said, So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. I read that right. So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. Do we live like a people who are free? Do we live like a people who have been forgiven, whose lives have been changed? Our eternal hope rests solely on Jesus. Our freedom is found in him. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about a man that needed freedom. This is a little odd one for me. I don't usually go to the demon-possessed guy, but that's where we're going today. A man who needed compassion, and it was a man who needed Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you're about to do in this place. God, may every word said and spoken be to glorify your name. Amen. Mark chapter 5, if you... If you're, we're in the New Testament, Mark chapter 5, turn to the middle, go to the right. If you see Matthew, Mark's right after it. If not, it's right up here on the big screen. Mark chapter 5. So it says, so they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of Gerasenes. And when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit or an unclean spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. And this man... Listen to this. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. This guy needs something. This guy needs something. Do you know what? The problem, in this day, they saw this so prevalently. For us, we have begun to dismiss the idea of demons and demonic influence. We kind of avoid that altogether. We don't want to know. If I don't know, it doesn't exist. I hate to tell you this, it exists. Demon possession is real. Demon oppression is real. Demonic influence is real. CBS, ABC, NBC, just turn them on. All you got to do is turn the news on. And you will see some of the most horrible, evil things that have ever taken place. And we are so filled with information these days that I think that a lot of these things have been happening a long time. It's just you never saw it. And now the new shock value is to put this out there. We live in fear. We're afraid of these things. We see these things. There's so much evil in this world. But we live in fear rather than in faith. This is John 10.10. 10. Jesus said this. He said the thief, and he was talking about the leaders of that day, those who were supposedly religious leaders, but he was also probably meaning Satan, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. This guy who's living in these caves, who's howling at the moon, who's cutting himself open, who's screaming and hollering, who's running around like a wild man, would this day, in this time, be celebrated in the name of diversity. Who else wants to go live in the burial caves? Who else wants to cut themselves? Who else wants to live this life? But Satan came to steal and kill and destroy. You see, Lucifer's greatest thing was that he was prideful. Now imagine this. You were created by God to worship and serve the one true God. You are surrounded by all things that are holy. And yet you choose to be prideful. I want to be God. I want to be in charge. And he was so deceptive to want to elevate himself above God that in Revelation 12, 4, it talks about he took a third of the angels with him. Can you imagine that? Hence, we have demons. 
because they were fool enough to follow a fool. But this is why we must be very careful about the voices we listen to. The things that pop in your head, get a hold of those things. Not everything's right. Not everything's good. Not everything's holy. When you're driving down the road and you're thinking, I should just drive off in that lake right now. That's not good. That's not holy. We need to take those thoughts. Think about this. This is why we have to be so careful. Garden of Eden. Satan influenced Eve's choice to disobey God. Listen to this. Genesis 3.1, it says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. Now, first of all, um, Satan would have had a hard time with this because I would have cut his head off before he spoke a word. It wouldn't have mattered. That just would have freaked me out to begin with. But he said this. One day, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit of any of the trees of the garden? Now, God didn't say that. But what happens when it comes to lies is they take a little bit of truth and then we're going to sprinkle it around with what we want it to be. God said, don't eat of that one tree. Satan said, did he really say you couldn't eat of any of the trees? And that's not what he said. Yet he was able to twist that. And then Eve began to believe that. Which led us to here. You see, Satan is cunning. He wants to destroy you. There is no Satan is my friend. I was telling the band in the back, I don't know if anybody's seen this, 2023, they're going to have Satan con somewhere. God bless them for it. Satan is not your friend. Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy you because Genesis 127. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Satan hates you because you were created in God's image. And he hates God more than anything else. So his goal is to destroy your life. And this is where this man found himself. He was there in the middle of all that. You see, as believers, we need to begin to familiarize ourselves with God's work. So for 2023, I want you to get to know Jesus. Oh, I know Jesus. How much time do you spend with him every day? How much time do you spend in God's word? I want a word from the Lord. I want the Lord to tell me what to do. Well, he gave you 66 books. And if you've not looked in them lately, you're going to have a hard time finding what God wants you to do. Because the closer we draw to Jesus the further away we move from the things that are drawing us from him. He said, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. Your loyalty is divided. And so we need to make a choice. Will I serve Jesus? But as believers, we need to be familiar with God's word. In today's society, the idea that if you repeat something long enough and loud enough, it becomes truth. And people will believe it even if it's a lie. And that's how Satan works. So you must, I must, familiarize ourselves with the truth. So that we are not deceived. I wonder for this man to get to this place. Verse 5, it says, Day and night he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. How many compromises did this man make to end up where he was at? I'm sure he didn't run to demon possession first thing. But he made a compromise. 
And he made another compromise. With each compromise, Satan got a deeper hold. These demons got a deeper hold, a deeper hold to the point to where he was living in the burial caves, howling and cutting himself. Sin extracts a heavy toll on us. Sin will take us farther than we've ever wanted to go, and it will cost us more than we ever wanted to pay. Demonic destruction of this man's personality had driven him to the point of insanity and ostracism. In other words, he couldn't be around anybody. And you saw where it said they often tried to chain him up. He was living in graves. Verse 6, it says, When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him. And ran to meet him and bowed low before him. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. I think maybe they recognized who he was. Don't you think? That even in their state of hate, their desire to destroy all things that God has made, they still understood who had authority. Who was in charge? Who was in charge? Jesus. And with that thought in mind, I want you to think about this. Who lives in your heart? Come on. If you are a Christian, who lives in your heart? Jesus. We have accepted Christ. The Holy Spirit has come to live in us, which means that God is in our lives. And if God is in our lives, then we don't have to be afraid of the demons that bow low before the risen Savior. They have no hold on us because we are set free by the power of Almighty God. Our sins are forgiven. Now, will Satan try to influence you? Will these demons speak in your ear? Yes. How many times have you heard, you shouldn't talk to that person about Jesus? Look how sorry you are. How many times have you heard, you might as well just go ahead and do something. Go ahead and kill yourself. It don't matter because nobody loves you. Jesus loves you. And you say, well, as Christians, do we face that? Absolutely we face that. Those battles, those struggles are not just prone to those who do not know Christ. Those are our struggles too. We are human beings. We still face that old me that wants to live like the world, that old me that wants to participate in all the things that are not holy and not godly. So we have to put ourselves into the word of God and we have to pick up our cross and daily stand against those things. But the power of Almighty God that the demons bowed low to lives in us I like his part verse 7 with a shriek he screamed why are you interfering with me Jesus son of the most high God in the name of God I beg you don't torture me or what do you have to do with me why are you interfering with why are you bothering me come on Jesus come on come on and then to say man this is this is spiteful in the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. As though Jesus' compassion should fall on them. See, one of the biggest struggles within our world is that we have allowed the world to decide who Jesus was. And not what God's word says Jesus is. Does Jesus love you? Yes. Does Jesus love you as you are? Yes. Yes. But Jesus loves you so much that he wants to change who you are to make you more like him. 
to root out sin in your life. We just want to stop on the Jesus loves me for exactly who I am. So I get to be me. I get to go to heaven. I get Jesus. And God's like, that's not how it works. We're about to overhaul this puppy. We're going to start something new. Your life needs to be changed. My life needs to be changed. And there's only one person that can do it. So they shrieked at him. They screamed at him. Why are you interfering with us, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. Maybe they thought that if we scream at him, he'll leave us alone. If we holler at him, he won't bother us no more. Come on, Jesus. Sounds like a defeated foe to me. Somebody that already knew what was coming for them. Verse 8, it says, For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. So I think Jesus had thrown down the gauntlet. Guess what's about to happen, fellas? Guess what's happening? And they're like, please, Jesus, no! Don't treat us this way. Like, why, why, why? Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Now, a legion, a Roman force of the day, was about 3,000 to 6,000 men. I don't know if there were 3,000 demons in this man, but there were a lot. And the thing about it is, I don't know if they just withheld their names. Of course, Jesus is already going to know who they are. But they withheld their names because they were, All right, there's a lot of us. What you going to do? What you going to do, Jesus? What you going to do? But hey, don't torture us. What you going to do? Verse 10, it says, Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. You see, Satan and his demons' fate have been sealed. Their rebellion against God is a guaranteed punishment. Revelation 20 verse 10 says, Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. 2 Peter 2, 4, For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. Luke 8, 31, which is this, which is this story as well, said the demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. Now whatever thought process was that came up years ago, that if you die and go to hell, you're going to party with the demons and all that. That is their place of torment. It was not designed for you and I. But when we reject Jesus Christ, we've chosen a side. And so that punishment is reserved for those as well who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. The evil spirits begged him again and again, do not send the, the, uh, the some distant place. Verse 11, there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. Now for a long time I always wondered about this. I'm like, why would you want to go live in a pig? Like, what is that about? And I found this quote by Charles Spurgeon, which a great Bible teacher, he said, Satan would rather vex swine than to do no mischief at all. He is so fond of evil that he would work it upon animals if he can't work it upon men. 
Satan is your enemy. Satan is your enemy. But when we choose to not follow after God, we are choosing a side that is against God. And so they begged him and said, please, let us enter the pigs. It says, so Jesus gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. And the herdsmen fled to the nearby town and surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran, and people rushed out to see what had happened. 2,000 pigs. So you got to figure if that was a demon per pig, guy had at least two, two grand in him. That's a lot of bacon going in the water. If this would have happened today, People had their cell phones out. Look at all them pigs running off. That man over there, that man right over there, he ran them pigs into that water. Did you see that? It'd be viral, viral video. Used to be things that were viral was something you didn't want to catch. I'm just saying. But now it's a viral video. It's viral. It'd be out there. People making videos. And that's the problem. There's so many people that want to make videos but not get involved or not understand the situation or not try to figure out what's going on or not try to understand what's happening. We just want to make our viral video. Verse 15, it says this. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus. I think I'd do it. You run 2,000 pigs into the water... That'll do it. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfect, perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. Verse 17, one of the saddest verses. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave him alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. You had a man who had spent probably the majority of his life demon-possessed, living in the hills, cutting himself, screaming. They tried to chain him. They tried to break him down. They tried to bind him. They tried to do everything they could. They tried to block him away. They tried to do whatever they could. Jesus came into town. Jesus set that man free, and they said, go away. Because that messed with their normal. It was normal for them to have a demon-possessed guy running the hills and screaming and hollering and cutting himself. We don't like all of this. We don't like this part where you run the herds into the water. And probably this was not a Jewish town, but mostly a Gentile town because the Jewish people couldn't eat the pigs. So they're herding pigs, so it's probably a Gentile town. And they're like, you, you got to get out of here. We don't want no part of this. Whatever this is, we don't want to be a part of it. And the problem is, is that even as Christians right now, when we see a move of God happening, we like to back on out. I don't want to be in the middle of that. I'm telling you something. God wants you to be in the middle of that. We are his church. We are his people. We must stand for truth, we must stand for him. But they wanted Jesus to leave. They were like, uh, we want you to go away. Go away. We, we, we don't know what to do with this. They were afraid. 
They wanted Jesus to leave. You see, these people completely missed the miracle. And I want to tell you something. We can do that too. We can completely miss the miracle in our lives. When God does something, when God does some things in our lives, if we're not looking at it through God's vision, through God's eyes, we may miss the miracles. We may miss the things that God's saying. We may miss the things that God is doing. God wants you to be a part of that. He's not holding out on you. He's not hiding from you. He wants to just blow your life up with him and just make it exciting, filled with joy. I didn't say it would always be happy or easy or good, but filled with joy so that we see God in the moments. When everything around us is burning down, we can have joy. Or as we always say, a dumpster fire. When we have a dumpster fire in our country, we can have joy. Because we are following Jesus. My circumstance does not determine my joy. So when we focus on who God is, we focus on what God wants to do, when we focus on God, and that's what I'm telling you, 2023, focus on Jesus. Get into God's word. Don't be like these people that when your normal is interrupted, you want Jesus to leave you alone. I don't like this, God. This is uncomfortable. This is really uncomfortable, God. I don't, I don't like this at all. 2023 may be the year that God asks you to do things very far out of your comfort zone. To talk to people that you were afraid to talk to. To share Christ with someone you were afraid to share Christ with. To help someone who's struggling and hurting. Maybe to be there for somebody. To bear somebody's burdens. Maybe to stand up for something. His truth. So that we're not asking Jesus to go away and leave us alone. We don't like this, God. We don't like it when normal gets changed. It's amazing what we are willing to accept in order for life to remain normal. What happens around us is the world slowly begins to put things in and put things in and put things in, whether it's programming, whether it's these things, to where we just get a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more comfortable. And we don't know what is right and what is wrong. We're missing what God wants to do. And so, verse 18, he said, as, he was get, as Jesus was getting in the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But verse 19, says, But Jesus said, No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off, check this out, to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed at what he told them. Can you imagine? A guy who had spent most of his life demon-possessed, a guy who had spent most of his life probably went to a town and said, you see this scar right here, these right here? I was out of my mind. I was howling. I was screaming. I was living. But let me tell you about Jesus because he changed my life. I am no longer bound by these demons. I am no longer bound. I am set free. Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus came to set people free. Something I want you to garner from this. We are never too far gone that Jesus can't redeem us. 
So if you're sitting in this place today and you think I have done everything that God would never, never love me, that is a lie. You are never too far gone that Jesus can't redeem us. But only Jesus can change our lives. No self-help guru, no pastor who stands in the stage and doesn't preach the name of Jesus Christ but wants to tell you, you can do better. No, you can't. I can't. Because my better is still as filthy rags. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. Because changed lives change lives. When our life has been changed and that, that begins to be who we are and how we live and how we live out life, the people around us will see that too. But believers must stay alert. 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay alert. Watch out your great enemy. Your great enemy. The devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking to someone to devour. So we must be prepared. Ephesians 6, 10 and 12 says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We are against rulers, evil rulers, and the authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Colossians 2, 13 and 15. You were dead because of your sins. And because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. When people reject Jesus, though, and his authority, they put themselves on the side of demons and are heading in the same direction. So here's what I want you to leave with. The demon possessed man's life was changed because Jesus arrived. The Savior seeks out all of us who are broken beyond repair by human standards, and he sets us free. This demon-possessed man could break physical chains that bound him, but he couldn't break free from the evil that consumed his soul and destroyed his life. But Jesus could. Back to John 10, 10 again. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have a life and have it to the full. Jesus came to give us a life. A life everlasting, a life with him at the center. He paid our price on the cross so that our eternal destiny could be changed forever. Because Jesus is God of the new. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your name and thank you for your goodness, for your mercy and your grace. Just ask that, God, you would move during this time right now. God, if there is any person who needs salvation, that, God, they would ask you into their lives allow you to change them for any person who is battling demonic influence or, or things in their lives that they're struggling with, God, or oppression, that, God, you would lift that, that, God, you would free them, that, God, you would just be who you are, the one true God. Amen. Let's all stand again. It's your breath in our
Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the opportunity to have worshipped you today. God, we just want to lift you up. Amen. Okie doke. A couple, few announcements here real quick. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Happy New Year, everybody. Woohoo! Uh, quick thing. Uh, next week, we'll be having... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's do men's breakfast first. Next week, there'll be men's breakfast uh, at the Mobile Cafe, 7.30 a.m. And then back to the other one, dear. Sorry. Uh, right here, that's my wife, by the way. I'm not just calling any random woman, dear. Uh, thank you to my wife who does all these slides week after week. I appreciate it, dear. And, uh, and then I don't follow them like she puts them in there because I'm her husband, and that's what we do. We don't follow what our wives say. All right, so anyway, if you are new here, we'd love for you to shoot that QR code, fill it out online, or if you would like to, I will be right over here right after the service and uh, would love to see you, meet you if you're brand new here today. Thank you for being here. You guys have a fantastic brand new year. Love y'all. See you, bye.